Hi everyone, uh, thank you for being here. We're pretty happy to uh, present at Point Lu. Uh, our talk is about uh, a group called Snake. Uh, we call it Turla, so you will hear uh, the Turla name quite often uh, today. This is a an EPT group, so a group doing espionage. So we, Mathieu and I, will be uh, talking about some of the recent campaigns we've seen and also some of the tools we've uncovered uh, and that gives us a glimpse on how these guys are operating. But first, uh, I'm Jean-Yann Boutin. This is Mathieu, uh, Faou. We're both Mauer researchers. We're both based in Montreal. Uh, we're working for ESET as Mauer researchers. So we do reverse engineering, Mauer analysis, and we kind of try to piece together all different campaigns out there of different threat actors. So uh, if we could take a quick look at what we're going to see today. So first of all, I'll go through a small introduction. So I assume that many of you know what is Turla? On the other hand, maybe some, some of you don't know that. So we'll look at some of the uh, very high profile hacks that these guys have been doing. Then we'll look at getting in and keeping access. So what I mean by this is kind of the overall cycle that these guys go through, from the infection vector to lateral movement to even cleaning the system once they're found and finally getting back. So some of the ways that they use to get back in uh, network that they lost access to. And then Matthew will take over and we'll talk about advanced communications. So uh, we published a report uh, two months ago about a, an Outlook plugin that is used to exfiltrate data and generally spy on their victims. And Matthew will go through all the technical details of this particular backdoor. So let's start. So Turla, also known as Snake, it's a group that targets mostly government, government officials, uh, diplomats, and they are very, very active. They are making campaigns uh, all the time. So we uncover new campaigns they're doing uh, from time to time. What really uh, kind of set them apart is the fact that they are very sophisticated. So the tools they use are very advanced. It's nice as researchers, as reversers, because we get to reverse uh, malware that is not so simple. So it's uh, a very nice work to do. So uh, before talking about the um, technical aspect of it, I just wanted to show you a couple of acts that they are allegedly behind. So this one was kind of the first notorious act. It happened in 2008. It was against the US military. And uh, they, at that time, uh, some US uh, officials said that it was the worst breach in US military. So this was a big deal back then. It was made by a malware called agent.btz. And please remember that, that name because we will uh, talk a bit about uh, this particular malware uh, later on. And allegedly, it was on a USB flash. It was put on a USB flash and dropped outside uh, a military complex in the parking lot. So very, an old trick that used to work well in 2008, right? So these guys, so someone would allegedly pick up the USB sticks, put it in the computer, and that's how everything started. And this agent.btz is actually a worm. So from there, it actually spread throughout uh, the network. So it was a very like high-profile hack, a big breach of the U.S. military, and, and it actually led to the creation of the U.S. Cyber Command. So that was uh, a big uh, b big thing for them. And then these guys, they really like to go after uh, foreign affairs, so ministries of foreign affairs. Here we see um, a, a news clip from 2013 that they hacked the Finnish uh, MFA. Uh, there, are, there are some... Um, other news that the Belgian MFA was act in 2004 as well. There are many, many uh, very public act uh, behind the, that these group allegedly did, and uh, it keeps on going, right? And one that was more recent was this one back in 2018, so a few months ago it was revealed uh, that the German government was actually attacked by these guys. And what is interesting is that the one of the tools they used during this attack was actually the Outlook plugin that Mathieu uh, will talk about a bit later on in this presentation. So, Turla in short, one of the oldest espionage group, they target governments, governments official, diplomats. They have a very large tool set, so they have a lot of tools, they have a lot of backdoors that target all major platforms, so Mac, Windows, Linux, and they uh, always operate the same way. So they have infection vector, usually spear phishing or watering, uh, water rolling, and then they install a first stage backdoor, kind of assess whether the computer is interesting or not, and if it is, they will deploy their more sophisticated second stage backdoor. So these backdoors are usually way more persistent, way more stealthy, way more sophisticated, and they, you only use them when the target is of high value. So let's talk about how these guys are operating. So in, in this section, I will 
walk you through four main steps of what these guys are doing and providing you recent examples of how, of the tools they were using back then. So first infection vector, uh, how they get in basically, lateral movement, so how the initial breach is transforming to uh, complete uh, on edge of the network. And then finally cleaning, so whenever they feel that uh, they are outed, they will actually try very hard to hinder the um, the incident response activities go that is going on, and finally getting back. So how they are able to accumulate data that may allow them to get back in the network once they're out, right? So let's start with infection vectors. So as I said earlier, these guys mostly they use spear phishing, so sending emails to targets with malicious attachments. Another thing they use quite a lot is uh, water rolling. So they are trying to compromise websites that are likely to be visited by their target. So these are kind of the two um, the, the, the two vectors that they use most, which is quite common in in APT group, but there was one particle infection vector that was that could have that kind of stood out. So mosquito, this is a backdoor. So we uh, we did a research on this a few months ago, and this backdoor is used to target diplomats in Eastern Europe. So what we see with this group is some of their tools that actually use them in specific regions. In the mosquito case. According to our telemetry, it's mostly uh, diplomats in Eastern Europe which were uh, targeted. And how they, these guys were able to first get in the network was using a fake flash installer. So of course this is not something new, it happens all the time. Uh, cyber criminals use all type of fake installer to uh, try to install their, their, their Trojan, their malware, and then install the real thing. But what was very, very different for this one, it was actually downloaded from this URL that you see here. So as you can see, this is the legitimate adobe.com, right? So it kind of triggered us to say, okay, what's going on here? Like there are many, many different possibilities, but still it's, it's kind of intriguing, right? So we had a couple of cases where we were able to trace down the full infection cycle. So a, a, a system that was requesting these Adobe Flash installer using the, uh, the URL, that should reach the Adobe server, right? And what was interesting is that we were able to actually get the DNS requests that were uh, issued by, by this system, and it was actually pointing to a valid IP address from uh, Akamai. Akamai is the CDN of Adobe, right? So this is, this looks very bad, right? Because you can think of several ways that these guys were able to get in, but one of them kind of comprises the uh, compromise of Adobe, which is kind of a big thing. And in this particular case, the package that was returned from this legitimate IP address was actually this fake flash installer containing the mosquito backdoor. So we kind of sat down and drew what the different possibilities that could have explained this weird behavior we were seeing on the network. So this is what we came, we came up with. So five different uh, possibilities, right? The first one would be kind of a local man-in-the-middle tag. So think of OSE file modification, these type of things. The thing is, we know that the DNS request was, the, was returning the correct IP, so we kind of crossed that one pretty fast. The second one on compromise gateway. So if these guys were actually able to compromise a router or had some access to some kind of proxy where all the traffic of the organization was going through, they, they would be able to inspect the traffic. And one thing I forgot to mention, which is very important in this case, is that all these requests were using HTTP, so no encryption. So that means that an attacker could actually look at the data and mingle with it, inject payload or do... Uh, all types of nefarious thing. So this uh, possibility looked very interesting because, of course, if you compromise the gateway and you have access, then this could explain the full behavior because even if the packet is supposed to reach the uh, real Adobe server, if it, if it is intercepted, and then the, the server could uh, send this fake flash installer. So the third option was that the ISP itself was modifying the traffic. What that means is that the ISP would be able to uh, monitor all the, the traffic going in from all their clients and we would be looking for specific IPs that would be targeted and inject them. So we can think of a compromised ISP or maybe one that would be coerced to, um, to participate in this type of uh, malicious activities. And it might sound a bit far-fetched, but it's not that far-fetched because we know several modules that is actually able to do that. So maybe some of you know about uh, FinFisher, which is a, a software that is used by law enforcement agency mainly, and there is a module there that can be installed in the ISP servers that is able to inspect all the traffic. So we know the technology exists, so this is something that is 
possible. The fourth option would be BGP hijacking, so trying to reroute uh, the IP on the fly to servers that the attacker could control. That being said, we looked at uh, the different announcement and we kind of crossed that one out as well because we didn't see anything um, malicious in while the attacks were ongoing. The fifth one would be the worst one, which, which would mean that the Adobe server would be compromised in some way, right? So really early on in this research, we reached out to Akamai and Adobe to kind of share with them IOCs and see if that was the case. And quickly enough, they told us, no, we were not seeing this type of activities on our server. So like we crossed this possibility right off the bat. So that means like the, the two most likely options would be two and three, that uh, along the way be, uh, from the compromised system or the soon to be compromised system all the way to the Adobe server would be some kind of gateway compromise or ISP uh, that would be able to inject packet. And in the end, uh, what we believe, we have no proof of course, but what we believe is that this is uh, actually man in the middle done at the ISP level. So first of all, if like most of the cases we've seen was the first, like patient zero, right? So the first infection in the compromised organization. So it doesn't make sense that they would be able to compromise a gateway and then try to infect people inside. It kind of, if they already have a, their, their feet in the door, their foot in the door, they could just use that to uh, infect. And the other thing is that all the victims are all within the reach of the same set of ISPs. So all the victims that we've seen the DNS request returning the correct IP address were all within the same region. So it kind of makes sense that it was more of an ISP because otherwise you would have to compromise each each gateway for each of these, these organizations. And then we saw multiple reinfection. What we mean by that is that these organizations were getting cleaned up and then a few weeks later, a few days later, boom, again. So really, if they did the work right and that they were able to clean the system, there's no way that the gateway would be responsible for this. So because of all of this and all the thinking that we did uh, together, we really believe that this is uh, what they're doing, which is kind of concerning, right? Because uh, we all know if you're doing uh, a download through HTTP, if your ISP is kind of on their side, it's, it's hard to be to, to avoid being infected. You really have to use HTTPS all the time. I think this is something that we are all aware of. But that being said, for this group, this is not something which is like that that blew our mind because we know that these guys, they're the satellite guys, right? They are using satellite IPs, a CNC, so they have these all SIGINT capabilities, which kind of ties in nicely with this hypothesis. So, uh, let's move into lateral movement. So once they have access to the network, what are they doing? So we looked through the different uh, campaigns they've been doing and we tried to find most of the tools they're using to recover passwords. What's interesting is that they have some proprietary tools that we'll take a look at, but they also have an open source tool or public tool that they use to kind of blend in, right? It's, it's harder to uh, say that this is a specific group if it's a tool that every pen test is on their fuses, right? So let's take a quick look at the proprietary tools first. So one that was interesting is the network sniffing. And why I'm showing it to you is that we actually saw uh, the command line that was used for this tool. So you can see it here. You can see it's trying to uh, uh, monitor specific IPs. I redacted them, but they are um, uh, internal IPs. Then they're looking at all these ports and putting all the traffic they capture into a log file. You can see here the watch ports. Uh, there are many of them, TCP, HTTP, POP3, uh, all types of, uh, of traffic flow they could use to recover all kinds of information to do their spying, but also maybe they would be lucky and, re and get some passwords out of this as well. Uh, the other proprietary tool I want to talk about is Clip Proxy. So this is an internal name. I guess that uh, many other companies name it differently. How they use it is basically reverse shell. So they will spun it on a, a system and then the operators can remotely connect to it and they have access to a command, uh, command.exe process, right? So they can list files, they can, they can basically go around the network. And they also have special commands. I've listed some of them there. So you have uh, ability to download executable, upload executable. So you basically have a shell where you can do your work of pen testers and try to uh, infect other uh, machines on the network. Now let's take a look at the different open source tools that we've seen. And uh, it, kind of a, it kind of fits in the general trend. Uh, the mosquito backdoor that we talked about a few slides ago, uh, we know that 
it, through the process of compromising um, a system, they also use Metrocretor. So there seems to be a shift towards m the, the usage of more open source tools for this group. So this one is quite sparse with DOM. So all of the tools I'll be looking at are mostly to dump passwords uh, from a compromised system. So this one is from Quarks Lab. It was uh, published in 2012. There's a GitHub page basically trying to recover ashes of passwords from local account, uh, cache domain credentials as well, and they have other uh, possibilities. Uh, the other one, Mimikat, I guess that this tool doesn't need any introduction. Uh, we see it all the time, so this is not tied to Turla at all. Uh, Mimikat is used by a lot of cyber criminals and, of course, a lot of other legit people as well. But uh, Mimikat is trying to recover passwords from memory, and it, can, it has other possibilities, but we assume this is how they use it. Then we have Lazine, which is a tool Again, open source, there's a GitHub page, and it's uh, meant to recover passwords from many, many different applications. So you can see here uh, a screenshot of the command line uh, help, and it can recover uh, passwords stored in browsers, uh, instant messages, uh, databases, passwords, Wi-Fi, even source uh, control application like Git and SVN. So it's uh, very powerful. Then some public tools, Nearsoft. Uh, I guess many of you are familiar with, with this suite of tools. They have many, many different uh, binaries available on, on their uh, software that they claim to be recover, uh, password recovery tool. And we found these three uh, specific uh, tools to, again, get access to passwords that would be stored in the browsers, uh, passwords that would be stored in my clients, and also messenger apps. So they would be able to recover uh, these different tools. And of course, using these passwords, we can assume that they are then using them to try to uh, move laterally on the network. One thing that uh, we found that we're pretty excited about is this one. So Comrade is a second stage backdoor that is used by these guys. And it's actually the, the uh, an evolution of agent.btz. So if you guys remember the first news clip I showed you about the US military network, it was actually this malware that was used in this thing. So they are Const constantly uh, improving their tools. And uh, we were actually able to recover a lot of evidence from a live comrade infection. So we were able to gather malware files, but also uh, log files, and we were able to see that this comrade tool was used as part of the lateral movement. So not only Comrade was present on, on the system, there was also a keylogger, there was also a recent file scrapper that would just go in and every time that a new document was saved or a new document was created, it would just compress it and uh, make it available for the backdoor to upload it directly to uh, the CNC server. And uh, the log files were really, really useful to understand how these guys were actually using this tool, right? So we have the log files that covers a three months period and it was really a two-step process. So once you decrypted the log files, you could see that in the first few days, they would do, um, they would issue commands that are likely to be done in a network assessment or trying to move laterally. And then for the following days, over the three months period, they were just monitoring the network, making sure that they were not detected, making sure that uh, their backdoor still had access to the command and control server. So there exist several commands that can be sent to the Comrade uh, backdoor. We will focus only on two because these were the main ones that were used. So the first one is changing the CNC server. So we can issue a command just to update this and then finally to execute command. So they will send a command and it will just spawn, uh, spawn and command the TXC process and, and run this command, right? So I've made a little graph. So this is the first few days. So you can see here they execute mostly commands. They updated a little bit of the CNC server, but most of the, most of the uh, commands we received from the CNC server were about executing commands. So the first thing they did is that they installed a, a tool that was able to dump the security account manager, so trying to recover ashes of passwords. And then they updated the backdoor, and then they issued a lot of commands. So they were listing groups that were in the domain. They were listing users that were uh, in, the, in the domains as well. Uh, they were trying to see uh, for specific users gaining specific information. So this was all uh, commands that you could expect a pen tester to issue while uh, he has access to a shell on a, a target system. And then after these first few days, it was kind of a monitoring period where the uh, updates, uh, the, uh, the update of the CNC servers were the um, the commands that we've seen the most. So they were trying to make sure that these CNCs were would always be available uh, for them. So this is uh, the end of the lateral movement. So as you can see, uh, a mix of proprietary public tool. Uh, once they're in, they try to expand and try to reach systems that will contain the information they are looking for. But 
cleaning. So they are very, very careful to clean the logs, clean the task as they go along. So we were very happy to see that some of these logs were not clean because usually when you get in the system, they cleaned everything. So all the logs are gone, uh, all the tasks they received from the CNC server are gone as well. But in this case, we were lucky. So if we look at the cleaning phase, uh, Gazer, which is a second stage backdoor uh, that, is, that, is, that was used uh, for, for a few years. Uh, we have a white paper on this one if you are uh, interested to know the details. Here I will just focus on the cleaning part. So all the important files um, are on this, like logs files, and they also have registry keys that they use to hold certain information like task. And they have regular cleanup, so whenever, uh, after, a few, after a few days of, of, um, of using this backdoor, Every time you receive a task, they will issue this command here that we see, CMC take loader body, which will clean uh, the logs, clean the tasks to make sure that if it's discovered, then uh, nobody will be able to, to see what, what, what happened and what was exfiltrated, right? But they also have a standalone cleaner. So at some point, uh, we felt that they kind of knew we were onto them and they downloaded and executed this cleaner, which really wiped, wiped out everything. So all the logs, all the registry keys. So they really have tools that are dedicated to make sure that all the uh, evidence are cleaned. Uh, we also found a, an undocumented backdoor. Why undocumented? Because we, can, we couldn't find any reference in the public uh, domain. And what's bad about it is that we were able to recover some modules of it, but not enough to have the full picture. And by the time we're trying to piece all the puzzle together, they just cleaned everything. So it's interesting because they rather delete everything on the system than having their most recent malware analyzed, right? Because they know he said we will probably publish something, so they just <laughs> delete everything and then they went away. So we're still working on this one, but I, I wanted to show this example because this is something we see all the time. So finally, getting back really quickly on this one, so we know that they could reuse the passwords that they gathered throughout. So if the organizations did not make uh, the correct changes, they could be a rebreach through that, right? But uh, a cool example is Mosquito. So Mosquito is a backdoor we looked at uh, a bit earlier. So it will actually uh, create a user account, Help Assistant, and this is a legitimate account that is used uh, through remote assistance sessions. So it's a user account that will be created once you try to, uh, to, to create a such, a such a session. But the Mosquito will actually create this user account that can then be used to, um, to get back uh, to get to, to have to get back the access on the on the network, and then uh, finally collects Wi-Fi credentials through the installer. So the installer has this command that you see here. So the net SHWN export, and it will export all profiles that are stored on the computer, giving them all the, the Wi-Fi passwords, which would allow them probably to uh, do all types of things, connect to this AP, trying to get back inside the network through this uh, through this mean and. I guess you guys are, are aware of all the uh, different news that went on with the Dutch government, the uh, uh, the, uh, the U.S. government as well, with all the pictures of the equipment and the trunk of the car. So this is uh, maybe something that that went on there. So now, Mathieu. So for the last part of this talk, I will present uh, the Outlook backdoor, which is a really good example of advanced communications they can use. So this research. Research started in 2018 when the breach of the, of the German government went public. So in this article from Spiegel, which is a well-known German newspaper, they say the group Snake is said to have attacked the German government network. So this attack was attributed to, to the, to the Turla group. Then a few days later, some details came out. Uh, so this is an article from the SZ, which is another well-known German newspaper. Uh, in which they say hackers have been able to copy data from the government networks via the Outlook mail program. So it was clear that during these attacks, uh, the Turla operators leveraged their Outlook backdoor. Also, the existence of this backdoor has been known for years in the community, but there were no public reports. So we decided it was time to look deeper. Uh, the targets are in line with traditional Turla targets, uh, we saw some Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Europe and some defense contractors, but we probably don't have a full visibility uh, on the victims, so maybe there are some other organizations targeted. The oldest trace of this Outlook backdoor is a compilation timestamp in 2009. Uh, I know that 
to, to other developers sometimes sometimes change the compilation timestamp in order to fool researcher. But this sample is very basic, so I think it was really the genuine genuine timestamp. Then in 2010, the first sample was uploaded on various total. Uh, so it reinforces the fact that the compilation timestamp of 2009 was real. Since then, they made a few changes. Um, so the oldest version was just dumping the content of the Outlook folder. So it was more like a plugin for, for their other backdoors than a backdoor by itself. But starting in 2013, they added the possibility to execute commands that were sent by email in XML format in the body of the email. So uh, it's now uh, a, a, a full backdoor that can execute commands. Then in, uh, in 2016, they switched from XML to, uh, to a blob of data in a custom format that is inserted in a PDF document. And this PDF document is attached to an email and sent to the real mailbox of the victim. So that's not, the, the backdoor is not connecting to, to a remote address controlled by the attacker. It really uses the, um, the mailbox of the victim. So, uh, I'm not, 100% sure of this date, maybe it was in 2015, because a compilation timestamp was in 2015, but the first time I saw it in the wild was in 2016. Then in March 2018 was the public announcement of the German incident in which, in which uh, Tiola used this Outlook backdoor. Uh, and a disclaimer, we are not involved in any way in, uh, in the incident response of this uh, incident. And then uh, last August, we published our report. So in the most recent version, uh, the installation is done by the backdoor DLL itself. And previously, they was using a dropper that was similar to, to dropper used by Comrades. Uh, it used com object hijacking, which is really a common technique for, for Tula that is used in Comrades on Mosquito, for example. If you want some background information, I put, I put two links. Uh, so this is not really not a new technique. Links are from 2011, 2014. Uh, but it works well, so they're, they're still using that to, to stay, to establish persistence. And in particular, it uses the Outlook uh, Protocol Manager, which is the com object responsible for Outlook MAP communication. So, so each time Outlook is, is launched, the, uh, the DLL of the backdoor is also loaded. As a reminder, uh, com objects are defined as HKEY cross root, which is kind of concatenation of HKEY current user and HKEY local machine. And HKEY current user can be modified with limited user privileges, so this backdoor doesn't need admin rights to be installed. This is the CLS ID of the uh, uh, um, Outlook Protocol Manager. Uh, you can see there is a redirection to another CLS ID. This CLS ID has an arbitrary value and is not used by any known application, so it was only added by Tula. And you can see that this uh, CLS ID is linked to, to the DLL of the backdoor. So when Outlook uh, uh, calls the Outlook Protocol Manager, it will actually load the, the malicious DLL. MAP is a messaging application programming interface, which is a standard Microsoft API uh, aiming at providing to third party software a way to be uh, in kind of email aware. Uh, and actually, with the com object hijacking, the backdoor replaces all MAP32.dll, which is uh, uh, a Microsoft DLL responsible uh, used by Outlook to interact with uh, MAP. So first, the backdoor connects to, to the mailbox using the standard function MAP logon. Uh, then it will open several folders. Here it opens the outbox folder. It can also uh, set callback, callbacks on folders using the uh, HR lock advising function. So now I will, uh, so they put uh, callbacks on both the inbox and outbox folder. So I will describe these two uh, callbacks. So the first one for the outgoing email, it will basically forward all the uh, emails sent by the victim to the attacker's email address. So we can see it in the logs. 
So uh, this is the logs of the backdoor. Uh, you can see that the victim sent an email to recipient at example.com. The, uh, the subject and the attachment name is also logged. And just after, uh, this email is also sent to the attacker. And finally, the backdoor clean uh, any trace of, uh, of this activities, activity, so uh, it will delete uh, the message sent to the attacker. So when the victim goes in Outlook and check in the uh, send folder, uh, they won't be able to, to see this, uh, this additional email. And not only the email sent by the victim are exfiltrated, at the same time the backdoor can also exfiltrate data, and data is basically the result of the backdoor commands and the log file that is regularly rotated. So to exfiltrate this data, they encrypt the data, they put it in, a P they create a PDF document with this data, they attach the PDF document to, to an email and send the email to the attacker email address. Um, this behavior happens only uh, when the victim sends an email, so it, it prevents the backdoor to sending email at unusual hour. So this is an example of a PDF created by the backdoor. You can see a typical PDF header. Then there is a one pair, one pixel JPEG email which is outcoded in the backdoor. And actually, they will add the encrypted data just after the JPEG image. So uh, the um, the PDF document is valid. You can open it in the in a PDF viewer. You can just you will just see a, a blank PDF. If we look on various total, we can find some operator email addresses. You can see they really look legitimate. Uh, so in this example, they use Gmail, Hotmail. But in recent campaigns, we have seen them using gmx.com, and the pattern seems to be always first name dot last name uh, at uh, the free email provider. And sometimes they even impersonate the victim, so we uh, we saw them uh, infecting a victim with a with a sample in which the the email address was in the exact name of the victim. So that means it's very targeted attack because they compile the sample especially for a particular victim. And actually, in the German accident, it seemed it was the same. Uh, Akan, who is a German journalist, said that they set up a fake mail account in the name of a significant other of, the, of one victim. Regarding the incoming email, it will basically uh, log information about the incoming email and also check if the attachment is a PDF and if it has a sp special format that contains the commands. So this is what we saw in the log. It's Okay, so they will also hide some some UI artifacts. So they will delete, as I said, they will delete all backdoor written message. So the message sent by the backdoor or received from the attackers. They will also put some hooks. So they put hooks on create window X, and you, we can see there is um, a check for NetUI HWND, which is a type of window which is actually the, the kind of window used by Outlook to display notifications. So when the attacker sends an email to the victim, there is no notification displayed. And in the last two options, they, they switch to NUI dialog, which is, I think, the kind of window used by uh, Outlook on Windows 10 to display the notification. So the backdoor is fully controlled by emails. Uh, the commands are contained in PDF documents. And it's operator agnostic. It means that if if you took down the email address of the attacker, he can just send an email from any other email address to the victim uh, and regain control of the backdoor. The format is really complex. I think it was to to prevent reverse engineering. Uh, it's again a valid PDF document and data. It's uh, just after a JPEG image. So this is a PDF I crafted. Again, this is. Uh, uh, t the typical header, then the JPEG image, and we can see th this is the beginning of, of what they call the container that contains the command, and there is a magic D, D, D. Uh, this is the um, full picture of the structure of the container. So first there are some headers with length, checksum, etc. 
then what they call instruction descriptors, which contain information that are then used to, to decode informa uh, to decode the instructions. So there is things like the offset of the decryption function in a list that is included in the backdoor DLL. So you need to, to reverse all the DLL to understand which offset, uh, uh, you need to, to put there. Otherwise, the backdoor won't be able to, to decrypt, uh, the container. And there are other things that, like, uh, the decryption key ID or the decryp decryption, decompression function ID. Then the batch of instruction, which is encrypted with MISTY1. And in a batch of instruction, there are several instructions with a common ID and a list of arguments. The functions are really typical. They, they can manage folder, launch process, execute file, and even run PowerShell in memory using PS inject, which is a, uh, a module uh, of uh, the Empire project. So probably you wonder what is MISTY1. Uh, but first, Tula has an, an history of using weird encryption algorithm. So I listed some of them. So they typically don't use uh, common encryption algorithms such as RC4 or AES. They also change all significant values. So it breaks all the tools such as FineCrypt. So we identify the main characteristic of the algorithm and then open Wikipedia to, to find, to find what, what was the encryption algorithm used? So it was MISTY1, which is like an encryption algorithm developed by Mitsubishi in the, in the 90s. They also made some change. So in the original uh, implementation, there is no in initialization vector. But unfortunately for them, the function that derives the key is a bit broken. So if you put a null IV, the resulting key will always be null. So you can encrypt uh, a PDF for any sample, regardless the hardcoded key uh, in the sample. And they also made some modification, like shuffling the S tables or adding the operation. So now, now I have a small demo. Okay, so this is the, uh, the DLL. Oh. What? <laughs> okay. So this is a DLL. We can see on regedit uh, the com object hijacking. So then these are the, the two PDFs. So, so this is val valid PDF documents. So this one with a snake. Then we open Outlook. Uh, so this machine is infected, so I can just send an email to myself. Uh, I don't care about the subject and the body. I just need to attach uh, a PDF document. Then I click send and receive. And it pops a uh, cal.exe. So it really works. It's just to show you that uh, this backdoor works and just by sending an email without any user action, you can, you can execute commands. So now some mitigations. So that's my first advice. Maybe you should delete calc.exe. <laughs> um, so one thing interesting to do is to monitor com object uh, hijacking during the installation process. And to do that, you can use uh, any EDR or, or write sysmon, sysmon rules. Uh, I also checked to, uh, Windows Defender Security Center, which is a console or Windows 10 to tune the, the security se settings. So on, with the standard settings on Windows 10, it works, uh, as well as on Windows 7. But we can try to, to tune the settings for Outlook. So 
I check to dis disabling uh, the creation of child process. So as you can see, now we can, the backdoor cannot launch cal.exe, but obviously the exploitation of the emails is still working. But we can enable the code integrity guard, which will prevent the loading of unsigned not, uh, uh, DLL not signed by Microsoft. Then we launch Outlook, and it's missing something on the uh, on the right. This, if you're not really familiar with the Outlook um, uh, interface, this is the send receive button. And as I said, the backdoor replaced all MAPI32.dll. So if we prevent the backdoor from being launched, uh, Outlook can, cannot use MAPI anymore, so you, you cannot send or receive emails. So this functionality really prevented the, the backdoor from being launched. You can also try to, to mitigate on the mail server side by blocking uh, email with, with a particular uh, PDF format. Uh, or monitoring the duplicate sending of emails because each time the victim sends an email, th this email will also be sent just after to the uh, to the attackers. If you want more information, we release a comprehensive white paper. I put the link to the PDF. We also have some IOCs and Yara rules on how GitHub. And as a conclusion, Chola uh, is not your casual and lazy attackers. They have a big tool set with advanced capabilities, a rootkit, outlook backdoors, they do man in the middle, watering all, etc. Uh, when they enter a network, they stay there for months or even years, and their primary goal is spying. They don't conduct disruptive operations, so you probably won't, won't see the, they are in your network. And during their long-term campaign, they are able to map the network and grab many credentials. So on compromise, yes, you need to, to clean the malware, but you also need to, to rebuild, rebuild part of your infrastructure and, and uh, change all the password, etc. Thanks for your attention. Uh, if you have questions, we can answer. Okay, thank you. So, oh, any questions? Okay. Can you do an estimation on the effort that was uh, done to create this uh, Turua, I don't know, backdoor? I mean, it, you, you mentioned it that it's not a simple attack, it's not uh, a lamer attack or whatever. So it, it seems that a lot of effort and investigation was w was already done in creating it. Can which, you, which backdoor? The Outlook backdoor? The, the Turla backdoor. Okay, the so the, ro the rootkit? Yes. Uh, I don't really know, but the rootkit is very advanced. It can spy on incoming network traffic, etc. So... I don't know how many hours of development it's, it needs, but it's pretty big. Uh, nice talk. Um, uh, you gave some advice on how to protect or prevent these attacks, right? But from my point of view, like it seems that there was no way that the victims could have prevented this in any way. It's very hard that any organization, governmental or non-profit or anything like that can put stuff like that in practice. So it's basically from from what I hear, it's like if they will get in anyway, so you can probably monitor or is there any any advice for actual organizations what to do? Um, yeah, but the main targets of Tula are big organizations like ministries or big uh, companies. So they have budget to do uh, sec security. They probably have budget, so this has a, the kind of protection you can enable because the backdoor is, is not installed with admin rights. So if you should if you change the setting, for example, in the Windows Defender Security Center, the the operators won't be able to to disable them. So that's still, uh, I think, a good uh, a good um, countermeasure. Okay. Any more questions? Um, I have a general one. What's the aim of Tula Group? They they hack the government uh, governmental organization and they want to steal data. Do do you know like 
in the bigger picture, what what do they want to achieve? Mm. Did did you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, so there are many other organizations that have been there. Uh, at ESET, we focus on technical details. But if you look, if you go on Google and type Turla, it will be pretty easy to see all the assumptions that are made on this group. That being said, they're going after sensitive data, governments. We can infer what type of organizations might be behind this. They're not worried about money. They're only worried about getting information, getting in sensitive systems. So it's kind of a, not obvious, but we can infer who might be interested by this type of, of information. Okay, more questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you.